See, I do listen to the comments, and it only took me half a year. King Arthur Legend of the Sword always had an uphill battle ahead of it. This simply because at this point Hollywood had already done the story of King Arthur and the medieval era in general to death, and not with that much success. But when the first trailer for the film was released in the summer of 2016, surprisingly things were actually looking pretty good. The trailer made it seem like this time audiences would get a King Arthur film that's drastically different from the ones seen before. A more lighthearted and more fun focused film, driven by director Guy Ritchie's distinct visual style known from his Sherlock Holmes adaptations. And the following year when the movie came out, turned out that's exactly what audiences got. King Arthur Legend of the Sword does have a lot of good stuff in it. It packs solid performances, a fantastic score, and most importantly, an endless collection of simply amazing visual moments. Visual moments made possible by Guy Ritchie's filmmaking style, which this time was cranked all the way up to 110%. Without a doubt, King Arthur was one of the best looking movies of the year. Moment after moment after moment. But despite all that, the most notable thing this movie is remembered for today is for being a failure. A critical and box office failure that cost the studio and the financiers close to a couple hundred million dollars. Ouch. And of course, since this is the internet, opinions were quick to follow. Many different people had many different views and explanations as to why King Arthur failed to draw in audiences. Oh, uh, they didn't have big enough of a main actor. Oh, the script was a mess. Oh, they tried to launch a King Arthur cinematic universe and messed it up. Oh, David Beckham ruined it for everyone. While I do think most of these claims do have truth to them, at least to me the key reason is a bit different. In my eyes there is one core issue rooted deep within this film. A core issue that ultimately kind of ended up ruining the film in a way that prevented it from ever reaching its full potential. And strangely enough, this issue has to do with the movie's biggest strength we already discussed. Its endless collection of amazing visual moments. As in, as much as Guy Ritchie's use of great visual moments is the biggest strength of King Arthur, it might also be its biggest weakness. Like two opposing sides of the same coin. And so here we are, fellas and fellarets. We're going to investigate the said visual moments of King Arthur further and through this possibly determine why it became such a forgotten flop. Why it became a failure. Oh, and by the way, that line I just said, that's trademarked. Uh, you can't use that. Before we move on to the flaw in King Arthur's visuals, I first need to shine a light on the good aspects. Because as I said before, there are quite a few of them. Take the action sequences of this movie. Simply put, they are all prime examples of masterful visual filmmaking. From huge epic wars to more personal level sword battles. Fantastic. If you've seen my Sherlock Holmes video, you'll know that in here Guy Ritchie utilizes many of the same visual filmmaking techniques as he has done before. He uses the snorri cam shot, he uses slow motion, he always makes sure to add in that one extra layer of aesthetic quality. And boy do these moments of action pack aesthetic quality. But in addition to action, the visual moments of King Arthur also extend to all other parts of the story. They are utilized in plot exposition, they are utilized in character development. And this way, they successfully make the story move at a much faster rate than normal. In the hands of any other director, this would have easily been a 3 hour movie. But thanks to Guy Ritchie's visual talent, King Arthur is compressed down to 2 hours, in a way that it now plays out at a pace on the level of the Bourne series, despite being a massive epic medieval story. For example, toward the beginning the movie has to establish Arthur's early life, but instead of bringing the story to a slowdown, Ritchie manages to swiftly skip through it by cutting together a compilation of quick visual moments, in fancy montage fashion. And with these short essential moments, we get to know exactly who Arthur is and how he came to be. Compare this to Batman Begins, where Bruce Wayne's road to becoming Batman is spread out much much wider. In other words, what takes Christopher Nolan the entirety of Act 1, Guy Ritchie achieves in just under 2 minutes. And he does it with nothing but the visual storytelling, without ever having to resort to dialogue. Same with exposition. As with most movies, there are scenes in King Arthur where a bunch of characters are just sitting around talking exposition in order to deliver necessary information to the audience. 
But with this film, those scenes are very rarely noticeable or boring, because it always breaks the scenes up by adding in visual cuts from other scenes to go together with the exposition. Instead of just telling about Arthur's incident with the Vikings, the film also shows that incident, and it does it in a very smart and entertaining way, which in turn makes the film very entertaining to watch. Another great example of King Arthur's show-don't-tell mentality is this part, where Arthur escapes his execution. After the good guys have fled by jumping off a cliff, the movie now has to establish why the soldiers don't follow after them. One way to do this would be to have a short scene where a commander orders the soldiers to follow, but they have to refuse because the fall is too high. That would be just fine. But instead of just fine, instead of having an actual scene, this movie adds in a very quick visual moment. One soldier shoving another soldier and he then reacting with fear. Not only does this keep the need of having an actual scene, it also works as a smart visual joke. It's a minor thing, yes, but still, it is a good anecdote as to why King Arthur was one of the best visual movies of 2017. It's why Guy Ritchie is one of the very best visual filmmakers working today, right up there with the likes of Fincher, Snyder, Kurtzell and Villeneuve. But all that positivity out of the way, it's time to acknowledge the weak point in this style of hyper fast paced filmmaking. The weak point in the method of using moments to swiftly skip through scenes and story. See, that method doesn't come free, it comes with a cost. Like I mentioned before, if King Arthur Legend of the Sword was directed by any other filmmaker, it would have been a 3 hour movie. But due to Garrigi being the visual author that he is, the runtime is successfully compressed down to 2 hours. And the way this was done was by joining multiple scenes together and intercutting between their most important moments. AKA, in order to save time, King Arthur includes only the material absolutely necessary for pushing the story forward. Everything else is trimmed off. And here lies the biggest core problem of this movie. The problem which makes King Arthur feel so devoid of any actual emotion. The problem of style over substance. Example, a great setup for tension in this movie is when Arthur evades the soldiers raiding his home looking for him and then gets stopped on the street by another bunch of soldiers. Uh oh, do they know who he is? Does he have to fight them? Will he be captured? All those questions are great constructs of tension. But of course, here they are also redundant, because before we the audience even get a chance to fully register the tension, the movie already cuts away to the next part. You know, because we have to get to that super cool moment where Arthur pulls the sword from stone. Another example, not long after, there's an emotional scene slash moment where Arthur's childhood caretakers are murdered. Or at least this would be an emotional scene, if the movie wasn't already intercutting with the next big moment, the moment of Arthur's execution. Simply put, because we're already watching and anticipating the next moment, we never truly get to feel the impact of this current one, because the movie is so desperately and so hastily trying to move on. To be clear, there's nothing wrong with moments in of themselves. In my Sherlock Holmes video, I gave Guy Ritchie props for adding a great visual emotional moment to this forest chase scene. But that's the thing, in order for a moment to work, it has to function as a part of a larger scene, a full, coherent scene. The way it doesn't work is if you cut and mix scenes up, just so you can then quickly jump from one passing moment to another. A movie can have a montage or even a few montages in order to swiftly skip through certain parts of the story. But your entire movie can't be one big montage. Since if the main purpose of your film is to skip through the whole story, then what's the point of having a film to begin with? More examples. The scene where we realize the main villain knows that Annabelle Wallace's character is actually on the side of the good guys. Should we take time to get invested in this tense scene? No, never mind, let's just skip ahead so we can get to the hella fine moment where Arthur first uses the sword. The Darkland sequence, where Arthur has to survive against multiple different supernatural beasts, or as I like to call it, the Dark Souls sequence. Should we worry for Arthur's life in this part? Nah, just do it as a quick visual montage and move on with the story. Have you ever heard the expression, it's not about the destination as much as it is about the journey? Well, with King Arthur, it's exactly the opposite. Doesn't matter how the actual scenes turn out, as long as we hit all of these moments. If King Arthur Legend of the Sword was a house painter, it would successfully paint every last house in the entire neighborhood. But the actual quality of those paint jobs, uh, better leave that out of the discussion. 
but don't take it from me. Here's one other filmmaker talking about creating tension in scenes. Who knows, you might have heard of him. It's like the suspense is a rubber band and I'm just stretching it and stretching it right, and stretching right. and see how far it can stretch. As long as that rubber band can stretch, the longer the scene it. can hold, the more suspenseful it is. That scene is more suspenseful at 22 minutes than would be at eight. Right. So you wanna just stretch it until the rubber band breaks. Now, I'm not saying that King Arthur should have 20 minute scenes, of course not. What I'm saying is that those scenes should extend further than just their most essential moments. Because like Tarantino implies, every time you cut away to the next separate scene and the next moment, the rubber band of emotion you've been stretching so far snaps and then you have to start all over again. Doesn't matter what kind that emotion is. Tension, comedy, drama, whatever. One great example of tension is the Mexico sequence in Sicario. Imagine if instead of doing it as a full 15 minute sequence, the filmmakers there would have taken a cue from King Arthur and just cut back and forth between the most important moments in order to save time. The sequence would have been shorter, yes, but would it have been as effective? I don't think so. Mexican federal police will meet you at the border and proceed with you to the courthouse located here. This is a high level target. Kevin, Keith, you want to stand up? The marshals will enter, so our friends from Delta have volunteered to come along and will escort the marshals on the exchange. Now be careful on the turnaround. If the Federal is a shooter, it's going to happen on the turnaround. The most likely spot for a hit will be at the border crossing on the return. Anywhere along the way, anyone not in this room is a potential shooter. The op isn't over until we get back here. Be alert, be vigilant, and be aware. Let's go. What? <laughs> if you hadn't pieced it together by now, King Arthur's main issue is that, simply put, it has way too much stuff in it. This would make sense too, since apparently the final story was a mashup of multiple different King Arthur stories the studio had made over the years. And in my eyes, there was ever only two proper ways to solve this issue. One way would have been to just bite the bullet and make this movie three hours long. But uh, somehow I doubt that was ever a possibility. So that leaves us with option two, cut some of the stuff out. This movie did make a lot of cutting, yes, but not the right kind of cutting. As I said, the way King Arthur cut down on its runtime was by mixing and trimming pretty much all of its scenes, and I don't think that was the right choice. Instead of mixing and trimming everything, it should have cut some of the scenes out entirely, and this way it would have had time to expand on the other remaining scenes. Because to be frank, there's a lot of stuff in this film that could have easily been tossed out. Take Annabelle Wallace's character, for example. In all honesty, she's kind of pointless. She's on screen a couple times and overall she adds pretty much nothing to the story, except for maybe some plot exposition. So if you're not going to do anything meaningful with her, you might as well just cut her off the movie. That way you could have taken the time spent on her and instead spend it on the daughter of the main villain. And now when the main villain sacrifices his own daughter, it would have been much more powerful. You know, because if we spent actual time with the daughter, then we could have actually cared about her. Same with the whole Dark Souls sequence. If you're just going to fly through the entire thing with a few visuals and some music, you might as well take it out completely. Especially since this sequence as well serves no overall purpose. Arthur never learns to use the sword here, so it doesn't serve a story purpose. And it's already been established that Arthur grew up as a fighter, so it doesn't develop him as a character either. The only real contribution this sequence has to offer is that one exposition flashback at the end. And if that's the case, just take the sequence out and spend the time elsewhere. Then again, I guess you could also argue that maybe the problem wasn't runtime. Maybe King Arthur was the movie Guy Ritchie envisioned. Maybe this time he just wanted to push his visual filmmaking style further than what we've seen in his earlier blockbuster movies. Could be. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really change anything, does it? Overall, I do think King Arthur is an okay movie, at times even a good movie. I've heard a lot of people really enjoyed it and I totally understand why. Because once again, it is by far one of the best looking films of 2017. 
and it's a prime example why so many moviegoers, including me, see Guy Ritchie as one of the best and most entertaining visual filmmakers of today. But as much as I can appreciate visual filmmaking, I still strongly believe that story and characters should come first, which wasn't the case in King Arthur. And here's the result. So, uh, Guy, when you're making Sherlock Holmes 3, I do want to see your visual eye back in action. But at the same time, just please remember to put the story and characters before it, like you did in the earlier movies. Uh, please? Okay then, my dearest viewers, feel free to express your thoughts on King Arthur. Was it a failure or not? Let me know. And also, if you have any movies you want me to take a look at, put them down in the comments below, with the reason why you want me to look at them. It might take me 5 months to get to them, but who knows, maybe one day I will. Alright, bye now.